amok or a performance lecture to commemorate the official universe-wide recognition of amok, amok, and amok as separate voices and a past, present, future, or the tail end of a 500-year-old scream in not one temporal tense. The double vision required to recognize the soul in a badly translated word evinces another way of being in and understanding the world. This dual communication hinges on attunement, which I understand as speaking in order to listen to others, rather than eloquence, listening to yourself. Alisa Tauber. Bo, mungkin perlu kita jelasin dulu ya. To enter the Indonesian language is a science fictional enterprise. It is a universe of speculative words, gestures, perception. This work is a move to remind ourselves of this, of these chronotypes. Indonesian, not bahasa, which simply means language, but bahasa Indonesia has no tenses. Thus, all translations into English where past or present and for future must be pinned down as definite are both potentially right and always wrong. A reductive tense cannot encapsulate the speculative nature of our language, the science fictional possibilities, destabilizations. And this is, of course, not to mention the other different linguistic cosmologies in the archipelago, over 700 other languages, and ways in which neurons enhance possibilities beyond modernity's fixity, persnickety predilection for pinning down linguistic cosmology, how stars move and imprint upon the body. Translations from Bahasa Indonesia as illustration, reminder. Kami makan. We eat, we ate, we will eat. Kami kelaparan. We starve, we starved, we will starve. The refusal of Indonesian and various indigenous languages to conform to have conformed to temporal orthodoxy is, was, will be, the greatest of wisdoms on the tips of our tongues and limbs, kept keeping, will keep, self-protecting in the leaves. The following is the story of how continually ruling factions interact with worlds in which they are certainly were, most likely will not be, not fully aware of how time passes past will pass, in what context. Unaware of or resistant to truths regarding what they have contributed, contribute are headlong towards future contributing to these time frames, centuries that impact body minds, human, animal, otherwise, through mitochondrial recall and retention of affects ancestral that have been or will be brought to bear. Ancestrally, we think thought of time within different geometries a non-linearity, cycles, continuance, motion, passing past will pass, steadily past Gregorian decades through indigenous calendars. This is and was will be the story of one such emotion, amok, and the ways it has been framed, claimed by twisted offspring of variant malevolences. Learning the word as a child, sense perception. When a baby, mangamuk, their fists flail in hot air, spittle shot through high decibels, their feet kick the toy truck violently away, their fat belly moves side to side, the giant of their land. Perhaps another example from a mind with this word inside it, for decades, centuries, and beyond, when an adult is led to mangamuk, their keyboard is thrown on the desk in their home where Big Boss can't see that bloodshot eyes and carpal tunnel have led them to primal scream. Rage, rage will rage, doing verb. Amok is a clean emotion, an anger so pure it purifies air. To mangamuk is that rage release, is that rage redux in infinite ways. When fingers bring the pixels and later adulthood, when I search for the words of English, the words of English deem as Amuk's meaning, it becomes a foreign word to me, with much different stories for this word than I have known, absorbed from childhood. An infancy filled with tantrums, the Amuk in which I Amuk. 
Thumbswip dictionaries and thesauri empirical claim different meanings for amuk than I knew before the stubborn carapace of adulthood had even crept in. Pathologies, murder, but we will come to that. First, we will let the word speak for itself. Voice voices for the singular word form in Malay or Indonesian can also potentially be plural of amuk. In a past, present, future, there are very many more instances of what definitions of amuk are used for outside of violence. Eh, tiba-tiba dia ngamuk. Ngamuk gimana? Gitu loh, teriak-teriak gitu. Rage plus the thud of sudden, a shouting, screaming, flailing. Sudden, however, may imply that before there was nothing below the surface that brimmed. We are kettle steam screaming. And you, a mock, are a diagnosis so banal it could only be evil. And you, a mock, are a digression of no uncertain phrenology. And the two of you have been witness to the framing of our non-human relatives as quote-unquote nature by colonial batons and to the maladies brown peoples have been forced to bear for 500 years, being heard at the very tail end of that scream and drowned a very appropriate very word, appropriate word. Out. out. We, the voices of Amuk, recall the following quote from Yoruba philosopher Bayoko Molafe. What we rudely call nature today does not even have a name in Yoruba culture because there is no distinction between us and the goings on around us. Mountains could be consulted, trees could have privileges. This is how babies in now Malaysia and the now Indonesian archipelago were taught across hundreds upon hundreds of languages, language cosmologies that were all forcibly hunted, hunted at the throat, some to extinction, for all this genius to cower under false mirrors' voices on the brow of a ship. Amuk one, waters. We, saucy will see, something horizon adjacent, the ships. We smell, will smell, smell the brine. With the waters came, come, will come, newcomers. And our language evolved, evolve, evolves. With the passing, ghostly past, will pass of goods through Arab, Chinese, Gujarati hands, our animus faith submerge, submerge, will submerge in Ganges and in Zamzam water, in Yangtze River. Our bloodlines crisscross in natal helixes. Our stars commingle. Materials of the universe create, created, will create bone and breath from our wombs. With the inborn memory submerging, submerged, will be submerged of such a span of earthly places. The many kingdoms and many wars in our archipelago, centuries of feet on backs and the weaving of peoples with place in opposition. At some point, Met meat will meet the barrel of shackles brought by ships. The ships say our very flesh is here for profit and there is such a thing as nature and it is not human. Instead of our interweaving lives with all that lives, they introduce us to the cloud of profit and say that this apparition is what nature is for and by the way, we are not supposed to be human either. You want to talk corporate history, look to the world's first proto-megacorp, the Dutch East Indies Company. Nearly two million of our bone and breath enslaved by the Dutch over 200 years. Adults and children bought, sold, if not merely indentured labor. Adults and children bought, sold over 200 years require a holding of the breath in respect. In horror, bright burst of prayer, <laughs> Your beloved walks into a black hole, unable to move their limbs, and you hear a splash. Our bone and breath that survive are in Suriname's Javanese, in South Africa's Cape Malays, and marked as developing world at home. Because the web of fiction known as capital persists, our bone and breath is, was, will be, in migrant workers who never seldom see home waters, 
accumulation of the fictitious web, the natural reason for such sanctities as family to endure this many breaks, are swamps a melee of molecules thrown into disarray. These waters, we are told, are no longer ours, were no longer ours, are no longer. If we fish, we fish for their far off queens and mangroves are not living kin. They are natural resources to be shipped off or made into Meniere's fortresses and gallows on the ocean. Our waters are carted to other waters. If you mangamuk against empire, if you grasp fully the breath between <laughs> You and your family will be shipped away from the only waters you know to eat exile for as long as the sun will taste your skins. On the ship for them, the waters are, were, will be calm. For your family, the waters are, will be, were, rageful, brimming. Burnt farms throw ash into paddy field water. Burnt trees to smoke us out of our forests fall into rivers and fire meets silt where Sungai meets Laut. Our animals hunted will hunt, they hunt them to burning, to furs and gilded stakes, mounted taxidermy mounts it will mount. Can they only see themselves reflected in the dead eyed? And fresh water sheds its skin as it sees salt water filled with bodies, and salt water mirrors spring water and both amass the spoils of destruction. Both haze and iron, a cloud tells us, I say when, I tell you when you are. I say these swamps are backwaters and not the fulcrum of your lives. Your sciences are not centuries old, but lint in our peaked hats. This place is nothing but amenities for our cheery vortex. You and your many generations of children will grow to throw fists and knives for your waters to be left to their stewards. As we say, these wood supplies are not for stewarding, at least until the 20th century, when we say the stewards are those we must first teach. Both haze and iron, it is forced down our ears. We do not care for the names of water gods or indigenous irrigation technologies. Wait until your great grandchildren get masters in natural resource management when we can tell you that we are developed and you can feel for yourself where that leaves you. We omit the ladder we place, placed, we'll place on necks with a scarf bundle of debt, gnawing, gnaw, will nod sciatica, and at rivers you used for all your needs, now filled, fill, will fill with the plastic waste. We export, exported, will export to your country from ours. Chemical iron, chemical haze, long standing disabling phase and official phraseology. When we ring, we'll ring our fingers about the environment suddenly trendy. We omit, we'll omit bulldozers lolling their maws at the grasshoppers and dozers gunpowder antecedents and written rules of law that place your fishing boats shriveled, your oceans soon warmed, and we will claim your ignorance of any way to ever stop tides of heat. We will corporate social responsibility, your revolutionary indigeneities, and oil slick our way through the feel-good advertisement landscape. Iron and haze care not for how all waterways breathe with human blood as their inverse and keeper. We omit, have omitted, will omit marketing you as paradise to hide mass graves and buying having bought will continue to buy your paddy fields against half millennia of farmer resistance and fealty to sacred waterways mowed down for influencer wedding venues and for your aunts and mothers and daughters to docilely massage the ankles of ours by waters we retain for their sound effects as heard somewhat faintly from the spa. We cage your so-called stewardship of waters. Iron and haze, blood is born on the sea, an oil rig births an unending rage. Amok, amok to bedrock. When they came, come will come. They mold Cerebele to lust for strip mining and roads tumbling out in ribbons from gold mine to copper mine to bauxite mine to nickel mines, carcinogenic in the name of green transportation and palaces in the Netherlands, Britain, France, Portugal, and all in between. A Tesla owned by an aging hippie in Sacramento or a French nobleman's summer house, what year is it? It's all export. 
ship shipped will ship. When we said say will say these plants you destroy or consume are relatives, they will laugh before they burn, burned, will burn them. When we said say will say these plants are medicinal ancestors, they will laugh before they stop to burn just long enough to study and claim Dwayne Johnson and Jungle Cruise. Cures and remedies that they will sell rather than share that they will in no way recognize as our ancestral. And in the year 2015, centuries after first contact, when nearly 100,000 children and adults in Indonesia alone are killed from forest fire and smog, they will not be mentioned in the press. Orangutans, however, will be mentioned. The definition of orangutan will also not be mentioned. Orang meaning a person or peoples in Indonesian, utang meaning forest. Utan meaning forest, they are our relatives. Now, where will be? And why our rainforests were ordered to be cut for wood in Amsterdam, keens across the Indian Ocean, branched cries heard as wind. Amuk three great fires. In the 2010s, true story, I will be on an environmental literature panel with a white nature writer who tells me and my Caribbean co-panelists that all this was done to make people's lives better. I'm more worried about Brexit than I am about climate change. Please forgive my accent. West and East Indian, the Caribbean co-panelist and I find ourselves on ocean waves and our recountings of brutal enslavement of lands and people are ignored. All this was done to make people's lives better. <gasps> if you shackle humans' loved ones and throw them into an abyss, you can take the entire biome they steward. All this abyss. The flames come, came, will come in stages. These bonfires, their vanities. When independence happens in 1945, our antecedents rejoice, we're rejoicing, we'll rejoice, but a snake has a particular way of returning and finding its fangs stuck into the body of a man who was once a very poor boy. Once in poverty, a condition only snake created, Suharto enacted a poor person's revenge armed and logistically supported, complete with a lengthy hit list by Western forces. In 1965-66, a genocide occurs of suspected leftists, including the literal massacre of what was once the largest feminist movement in the world. Marked leftists included labor organizers and indigenous activists and gender and sexual and ethnic minorities, and all of these people who wanted or land water air relatives kept for us to continue to try to protect. The government is overthrown and a 33-year-old dictatorship based on capital and assassination for more earth for capital, the new order into which I was born and in which I was schooled, grounds ground will grind itself into bedrock. What happens when all the people who try, tried, will try to protect are murdered? This, the ongoing project on land and water relatives from the Amazon to Kalimantan. All switch up heartache and mine poisoning and factory suffocation and oil rig flares are this project, are these people where them will be. Amuk for heat rises, rose will rise in the sky. For them, the air has been calmly surveying a supposed dominion of humanity. For us, the air is rageful. The air our relative has been fed, feeds will feed all our screams. In past, present, near future, rainforest is sold to the same family lines. And this time, as offsets that have been called out as greenwash again and again and fucking again by people who will be disbelieved even after they're killed for land deeds, as their children are threatened until the bidding war is won as an Indonesian government worker is poisoned to death for seeing the future and raising a hand to mining blueprints. Minerals from earth that should have stayed under lie across the spherical home. Our communications gathering and gathering speed through rock turned digital and cables underwater that spark electric fire and the ways the elements are drawn into quarters ultimately spurs us closer to conflagration. 
and faster and faster just as Earth herself has been led to turn. To the very end of a 500 year long scream, in this the time, future, past, present, its cry persisted, persists, will persist. Amok infinity waters. Place the word amok under the gaseous haze that arises from fire, flint sparked flame on a shallow riverbed under pebbles and earth. The word is changed by every element, wavy in the smoke, trembling under clear water, curved by the weight of stone. The colony has thrown every element at this word and declared it bent. The amok of Dutch, Danish, and English. I would like a catchy phrase to describe the twisting of a word into a context that pathologizes and derides the original cultures of this word as belonging to psychopaths, then forces those cultures to include this psychopathic description in new dictionaries. Perhaps the word for this should simply be the titular example of it. Let us do some close reading of Wiktionary.org, which is, I am sure, the reason you knew you would definitely be attending today. Oh, yeah. That website says Amok, in Dawi, Amok. Proto Malayo Polynesian, Amok, a cognate of Tagalog, Hamok, and Maori, Amo. For remember, now Indonesia was seafaring and trading from now Australia to now New Zealand to now the Philippines. I believe Wiktionary.org is correct in this respect, but not with regards to the meaning listed. They say the form Mangamok is a reflexive, so it means either to self involve in rage or to self run amok, the kind of rage that both a violent keyboard smashing or a baby might express. But run amok, now more often run amok, is in itself an anglicization steeped in bayonets. From etimonline.com, <laughs> the entry for amok, amok adverb, 17th century variant of amok treated as a muck by Dryden, Byron, etc., and defended by Fowler, who considered a mock didacticism. Entries linking to a mock, a mock adverb. In run a mock, a verbal phrase recorded by 1670s from Malay, Austronesian, amok, attacking furiously. Earlier, the word was used as a noun or adjective, meaning a frenzied Malay. Originally in the Portuguese form, amuco or amuco, my world. There are some of them, Javanese, who go out into the streets and kill as many persons as they meet. These are called amuco. From the book of Duarte Barbosa, an account of the countries bordering on the Indian Ocean and their inhabitants, circa 1516, English translation, compare mock. Why would a Javanese person, Java, both colonizer of other islands and brutally colonized, be driven to anger? If someone enslaved your family, including your relatives of animal, mineral, rivers, literally worshipped and given names, would your efforts to free them by killing their captors be made into a feature film? If you go to the dictionary on the devices many of us, including myself, have from the company named after fruit and created from poison mine shipping, poisoning fruit, working to the brink, you will find amok, also amok, adverb, phrases run amok, also go amok, behave uncontrollably and disruptively. The kids are running amok around the house, figurative. Her feelings seem to be running amok, origin. Mid 17th century via Portuguese amuco from Malay amok, rushing in a frenzy. Early use was as a noun denoting a person in homicidal frenzy, my bolding. The thesaurus that comes with this device, amok, also amok, adverb, phrases, run amok. The army had run amok in the town, killing and looting, go berserk, get out of control, rampage, run riot, riot, rush wildly, madly about, go on the rampage, storm, charge, behave like a maniac, behave wildly, behave uncontrollably, become violent, become destructive, go mad, go crazy, go insane, informal, steam, raise hell. North American formal, go postal. Amok is a rage that does not necessarily claim victims, turns into amok is a homicidal psychopathology, and to run amok is directionless. They have bent our arrows out of shape. Words turned misshapen, 
the bearer of the word amok, potentially infants, potentially yourselves, has become either criminal or feral, and there is supposedly no cause that one has ever, could ever, will ever discern. The army had run amok in the town, killing and looting. This is ironically an appropriate phrase, considering how amok, the original, the rage, manifests, manifested, will manifest after hundreds of years of being made colony. General Suharto leading his army to a genocide of up to two million as he keeps and keeps the heart of a boy scarred by poverty until he is squeezed all in her innocence ragged. The story of Amuk's now etymology, I do not know that there has been a boot over your chest for 500 years. I do not recognize that this boot is mine, the foot is my own, and I have rested comfortably on your lower belly as a stool for entire generations over, and it is your forests I have obliterated to concrete, and it is your nation state's debt I have held over the peatlands as incentive to choke your own selves with industrial smog in order to emulate us. The genesis of Amuk. I do not recognize the presence of other tenses in every tense. The gall of pathologizing Amuk is the journey through languages it's been molded through, through macheted etymology, until a meaning implying mysterious illness causing mass murder joins the Indonesian Ministry of Education's dictionary itself as the first entry. The second entry in our official dictionary also denotes murder as outcome. In the official Indonesian dictionary, amok as emotion, the baby rage, self-consuming fire, or meaning is not listed. In its stead, the third meaning in our dictionary for amok, a psychological term referring to an uncontrollable condition, a riot with violence. The story of amok is that of tongues being swallowed whole and ever quietening forests. Suddenly, their heads awake when the smoke has finally reached their nostrils after hundreds of years, when the water line threatens their bed frame sourced from now corporate lands. And they cry, humanity ad nauseum. This crisis is humanity's fault. Something's wrong with humanity. But they would be saying that, wouldn't they? We were never supposed to be human. Time and again at work, I am complimented on my anger. Um, my last gig before the first lockdown, I was told on a bright stage by a former world leader, <laughs> having just pointed out that plant trees does not include how palm oil trees in plantations built on rainforest ash or poison writ large. I love your rage. The echo of it throughout continued indigenous genocide, like a fucking valley girl chasing after me. I love your rage. I love your rage. I love your rage. I love your rage. As though it is a painting or a one woman show, but perhaps to them it is, was, will be all these words ever are. I sometimes ask myself, is this what I'm fucking doing here in England? Over and over again, just here's some rage for you to maybe love before the stage dims and we retreat to our homes. The shame of hearing this that immediately bleeds into the rage when someone says they love it on stage. Which stages? This blade is a prop, it is said to my face turning warm. No, says the blade. If these living words did not exit into rivers of others' rages in communion, they would not, my fascia, I know this. And in addition, it is unuseful to fret about how anger is framed when you know the stakes and plays of the game. What does it mean to be praised for feeling fire? Why must we relay a litany of genocides to try to spark a pinprick of empathy? in silk-cocooned minds, running on muk interference in an age of metals turned surveillance. Anger creates spears of force, planetary genesis, creates DSM-worthy crimes out of words innocence. And what is said to run amok? Children, farm animals, those with cognition not recognized as being heard approved, bodies undulating in riots, 
hooligans, thugs bearing disrespect on the move, no logical causality for, unless to prove the cause is illogic. The threat of amokness, lest rules laid down by enlightenment presumptuousness are allowed to be hammered in, fence posts, corrals, barbed wire, and skin. Your beloved walks into a black hole, unable to move their limbs, and you hear a splash. You rush with your fist against the black hole. It tells you there was, is, will be no beloved. If there was, is, will be, it is, was, will be happy. And there was, is, will be no waters, not a drop. So you must have been mistaken. And why are you running amok? Through most recent prior centuries, amok is absorbed into European vernacular, Dutch, Danish, Portuguese, English. I love your rage, it's all the rage. They love our rage. It suits the civilizing mission. It suits Terra Nalia's terraforming. In a sense, it is a resounding victory that you have not been able to capture our my essence. To pawn, have pawned, be able to pawn these four letters as another word for storefronts and amnesiac thesauri. In a sense, it is indeed a tactical triumph that you do not, did, and will not know where my fire lies, that your satellite maps, hungry for new ground, regard our my combustion into flames as flailing, lacking direction. Each element feels the presence of and is the presence of Amok. Each animate and seemingly inanimate thing, the stones feel Amok, the bones above ground and below. They feel it with us so none rage alone. There are secret, sacred homes hidden in planets across linguistic cosmologies so complex they baffle string theory, where Amok is felt, cradled, nurtured as a seething that encourages delight guffaws a holding of each other beyond certain maritime holds. And to self-made wooden boats to glide across rivers reimagined as serene, clean hours, to violently dismantle infrastructures of disbelief, to spit on a force field and watch it crumble. To rage, not for display. To rage, not for a sucking into the matrices of acceptable emotion. To rage beyond respectable castle yonder. To rage beyond third world, underdeveloped, left behind. To rage beyond gilded names for fictitious crimes and fictitious capital. To rage beyond our own skins acquiescing to the audience in order to survive. There are whole universes in which Amok does not mean death. In these interpretations, Amok means Sahabat, Sahabat, kita hidup. We were alive. We are alive. We live. Thank you very much for the Hello and welcome everyone. Can you hear me okay at the back? Yeah. Welcome to the Edinburgh Futures Institute and to the Edinburgh Future Conversations series. It's really great to see you all here and welcome also to those people joining online this evening. My name is Esa Aldegheri. I am a writer and a scholar. I am very glad to be here this evening with Khairani Baraka. I would like you all to just take a minute to resettle after what was very, very powerful and listen to me telling you a bit about Khairani, who's also known as Okka. So Okka is an Indonesian artist and writer and her work centers disability justice, anti-colonial praxis and environmental justice in many different and wonderfully creative ways. She has presented her work widely internationally and has received many honours for it. And to give you a range of the breadth of her talent and abilities, just a little bit, she is the editor of Modern Poetry in Translation, and her most recent installation featured at the Museum Nacional for Jakarta Biennale, and her latest book called Ultimatum Orangutan, published by Nine Arches, 
was shortlisted for the Barbellion Prize. So it's a great honour to have her here with us tonight. I'd like you to join me in showing her warmth and welcome and appreciation, please. Oka. Thank you. Um, thank you all for bearing with me, literally yelling at you <laughs> for a long time. Thank you so much. I see very moved faces, so thank you. Oka and I will open up a conversation on many thoughts and themes connected to the performance and more widely. And then that conversation will be opened up to questions and answers from yourselves, the audience here, and also the audience online. If um, you're hearing this now, please feel free to start writing up questions in the box underneath your video player and they will come up on this magic tablet and I will read them out after our conversation now. So, so many thoughts and emotions and questions. I, I wonder if it's a good, I think it's a good idea to start from language, the power of language, which is so manifest in you here and now. And this one word, amok, Amok, yeah. Amok yeah. which you, you, you take to show something of the dynamics of power and truth behind translation. Yeah, so. absolutely. So um, the first thing that I wanted to tell you was that Indonesian has no tenses. So everything, I say that all translations from Indonesian are science fiction <laughs> because they are both right and wrong. And um, I think a lot about language and how language has moved through time. Mm. Um, we don't talk enough in Indonesia, I think, about how literally the um, Indonesian Ministry of Education's dictionary has three meanings for amok, mm. which all relate to violence. Mm. Amok means rage. I didn't even know that amok was related to run amok or run amok until I was an adult. And I didn't know that amok, quote unquote, right? Um, is what Europeans called violently murderous Javanese who came supposedly out of nowhere. Like, why are they, why are they killing people mm. when over 200 years, Indonesia, what is now Indonesia, um, our people were literally enslaved. And a lot of people don't know that slavery happened in Indonesia mm. for two centuries. Mm. And it is instead, any resistance to that is treated not as heroism, of course, but is treated as psychopathology. Yeah. And that has actually seeped into, as mentioned, Danish, Dutch, Portuguese, and English as a mock, right? Yeah. A mock meaning a murderous, violent rage, killing everybody. And that goes, that is further um, demeaned by run amok, right? Yeah. As, you know, flailing, directionless, directionless yeah. um, wild. And I just thought, what a way to, um, treat very valid rage as either criminal or inconsequential. And I see that silencing and demeaning over and over again. Um, and I'm usually very um, demure, I promise. <laughs> but uh, opportunities like this where I can give performance lectures, which I, I, I'm also a teacher, I teach a lot, but I, I also enjoy opportunities to do performance lectures like this one because I can actually in a more legitimate way, channel all the, I think we all feel rage to we different, rage. right? We all feel it. But there are very few places where it's legitimate, especially if you're a woman, especially if you're brown or you know, disabled, et cetera. There are very few places where it's legitimate to actually express it, even though it's valid, right? Even though it's valid. Um, and what I said earlier about, you know, in 2015, nearly 100,000 Indonesian people were killed mm -hmm. in the forest fire. So I grew up in an environment of, indigenous activism. And so what to people is very, what to people here I realize is very abstract, like, oh, forest fires, okay, like carbon offsets, awesome. Um, I love that Valley Girl voice, I just really. Good at it. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks so much. Um, I know, because I know so many people on the ground, that these offsets are bullshit, and even Greenpeace UK has said, this is, offsetting is greenwashing, and London has, it's being Rishi Sunak, uh, you know, declared. Oh, London is going to be from now on the cap, the world's capital of offsetting, which is scams. Mm -hmm. It's basically saying you can pollute here if you buy this rainforest. And by the way, through back channels, that rainforest is being sold to Shell. So what it is is you are literally buying indigenous land, yes. legitimately, quote unquote, 
selling it to companies through back channels. And also, if you buy a piece of land, you're saying, I know how to manage that land. Yeah. You're completely denying indigenous, even if it's like partnerships, but you know, indigenous communities and whatever giant evil mega corporation, it's not, it's so destructive. Yeah. Um, and in 2015, when those forest fires happened, it's like one of my earliest memories is my parents dropping everything to stop um, an earlier version of the, these, this happened cyclically, right? Gigantic forest fires. Um, and when, when the 2015 forest fires happened, I was so shaken, but I, so shaken every time these genocides happen again. And people don't even know about them here. And uh, last year, I was introduced in a meeting to a German journalist who's writing a book on nature. And uh, he said, he was introduced to my work and he said, you know, I covered those forest fires in the news in 2015, but I only mentioned the orangutans mm. and I didn't cover the social justice angle. And I, I wasn't expecting to cry in this performance. I really did because like, it's literally my, my book, Ultimatum Orangutan or Ultimatum Orangutan, it's a bilingual title. So orangutan is mentioned is a compound word. Every time you say orangutan, you're speaking Indonesian. Orang means person or people, Utan means forest which also shows this whole non-separation yeah. between us and what you call nature, quote unquote, right? It's like, we call them literally people of the forest. They are our neighbors, right? They are as much people of the forest as we are. But um, they are elevated above us in campaigns against palm oil even, which is so destructive, palm oil plantations, you always see orangutans and you don't see people, you don't see children, you, you don't see, um, and, and once there was, um, uh, there's another poem I wrote uh, that was published in Massachusetts Review about a conversation I had with a friend of mine who was a journalist for an international news organization. And she was working in Indonesia. Um, and the 2015 forest fires were being covered and all of a sudden uh, the headquarters in the UK, uh, let's just say it rhymes with CDC news, um, <laughs> said, oh, we need orangutan coverage. And she told me the, the cameraman was fear, so outraged. And the cameraman, by the way, wasn't even Indonesian. I think he was actually um, a man of Caucasity who was, had been brought up in Indonesia. So he was a local, but not, you know, he wasn't Indonesian. And, but so he knew the content, and he was so furious because he's like, babies are dying. We j we're shooting a baby who's like about to die. And, London needs orangutans, mm -hmm. which we don't think orangutans are below us, once again, as equal, but they are so much elevated above indigenous peoples. Yeah, Animals are often elevated above There's indigenous. so much power in the way you used the, the rage against not just the, the changing of a word and its meaning, but the tr how it's been traduced. And in Italian, which I also am, tradurre, translation, is to do with tra traducing, but in the sense of bringing from something to something else. Mm -hmm. And it, it really feels strongly in, inside me, the way that you've taken this word and shown how it's been brought from its original meaning into other meanings and taken into something else that is used not only to misrepresent and minimize the past rage, but also the current rage. So it's, it's really ongoing. And how I use linguistic cosmology. I wanted to ask oh, you Oh, sorry. About that. No, 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 great. <laughs> Let's talk about but linguistic cosmology. So what a great said, phrase. You said the rage now and the rage then. Yeah. But language shapes how we perceive the world, yeah. right? It completely shapes, like, you know, whether gender denominations or, you know, everything else. It completely shapes our psychologies or universes. And because I come from a language, and by the way, Indonesian isn't alone. There are other, many other, I think, indigenous languages who that are... Um, or languages that don't have tenses mm -hmm. um, in South America and elsewhere. If you think of every, every verb as potentially being past and future as well as present, you understand that there's no such thing as those clear demarcations. So I see the amok, I see the rage as being just an entity in past, present, future. And it's this, the rage now is connected to the rage then and yeah. the rage to come, it's all one circle. Yeah, yeah. 
that's such a that's such a clear and powerful again part of the the performance and the knowledge that this performance has brought certainly to me i did not know the fact of right there's nodding in the audience that indonesian had this temporality within itself which transcends categories of past present future and i'd love to hear more about your thoughts on how this knowledge of temporality can help can help or can inform even ways of looking at the world that is burning around us. A hundred percent. I think a key there lies in, I mentioned earlier the word management, right? <laughs> We're all unfortunately familiar with that word in our yeah. lives <laughs> in, in many different yeah. forms, management. And the way, the financialization of nature, everything from carbon credits to you know biodiversity credits are getting so hot right now, biodiversity credits. Um, and this is all ways to control lands that should be returned to indigenous peoples. Mm. It is a way to capture and control. That's management, right? And in a way, tr translation, which comes from tarjama, which I think is mm. also Arabic. Yeah. Um, in Indonesian, translation is penerjemahan. Uh, okay. It comes from, and to tarjama means to translate. It comes yeah. from Arabic. Um, it is, Translation and fixing, as I said, there's, oh, this, this is the correct translation of this Indonesian mm. sentence, is management, right? And it's part of this whole enlightenment, positivist BS of like, oh, we know science, this is positivity, this is, um, you know, we based on, on yes, evidence-based rationality, yeah. et cetera. And it's like, there are entire, there are thousands in the Indonesian archipelago alone, we're like the fourth largest country in the world and we have over 700 languages and cultures. Those are 700 different cosmologies. Yeah. Those are seven, 700, over 700 different universes and ways of understanding science and nature and quote unquote nature. Um, and it just collapses all this colonial It does, it stuff. really does. There was a line that I, it really struck me, um, linguistic cosmology, how stars move and imprint upon the body. That just stopped me, the line from, from, this, from this performance, from, from your script. I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on this linguistic cosmology, how stars move and imprint upon the body. Yeah, I think like a lot of writers, I don't really understand why I've written something until after it's done. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. Oh, yeah. um, so <laughs> I think the, what was going on in my head then was, I mean, we're all stars, right? Oh, we're made of stars. So, yeah, it's cheesy, but it's true. So deal with that. Um, we're made of stars. Everything is made of stars. Um, and also stars are used, were, you, were and are used to tell time. And will be. And will be. Yes, or are will be. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Where our will be, our will will be, uh, used to tell time. Right. Yeah. And our understandings of time are also how stars imprint upon us. Mm. Like the light of the star is already. Yeah, past. and how other human beings, because other human beings are also made of stars, how mm. other human beings imprint upon us. And that becomes language and that becomes culture. Yeah. It felt connected in my mind, and I'd love to hear you explore it more, but the, the also the idea of um, double vision, which was in the quote from El Eliza, Elisa Taber. Elisa Taber, yeah, Taber. she's um, a Paraguayan right. writer and translator. Um, we were both in this anthology that just, I actually um, was at an event in, Ed in Edinburgh uh -huh. recently for, uh, called Violent Phenomena, 21 oh, Essays yeah. on Translation. Mm. It's out with Tilted Access Press, and I highly recommend it, but Elisa has a, some, an amazing essay in it that really blew me away, and that quote is from the essay. Yeah, um, I will go get. Yeah, and it's about the like when a word vision. is badly translated, uh -huh. she's saying, if a word is badly tra translated, you have to deal with that sort of double, triple consciousness of, you use this word, and you know that it's such a bad translation, but yeah. you have to use it. Yeah, okay. Or, you know, um, and, and, and that is part of, uh, attunement, which is listening to others rather than eloquence, listening to yourself. And yeah. I think that capitalist colonialism, which is what climate crisis is, climate crisis is the tail end of 500 years of capital colonialism. And yet it's all, everywhere you hear, it's like humanity's problem, yeah. humanity, this was made to make people's lives better. It's like, are you, that is denying mm. all the people who were enslaved or exiled or killed or raped or assaulted because they wanted to protect their neighbors, yeah. land Our life. and water, forests, rainforest all around them over the past 500 years. Yeah. And you're saying, oh. speaking of time, <laughs> did you know? No, actually it's perfect. It's like management, right? We, I have 
oh, reminders on my phone all the time, right? It's always like, what time is it right now? When is this, you know? And the world is increasingly this colonial time mindset. I mean, the way that we tell time was not always this way. We didn't always have weekends. We yeah. didn't always have weekdays or weekends. And there's a real sense of urgency about time as well. You know, like a feeling of growing and constant, time is running out, time, urgent time, time, we have no time. Have we got time yeah. to, to do what needs done or to think what needs thought in order to change what's happening to the world, to the forests? Exactly, the you can't ocean, understand so. the urgency of this moment unless you understand the past. Yeah, yeah. And you don't know what you're talking about if you're like, humanity created this. If mm -hmm. you don't understand that climate crisis is caused by capitalism and colonialism. Yeah. Capital, capitalist colonialism, because that's right. the origin of capitalism, is the Dutch East Indies Company is the first like state-sanctioned megacorp um, that created yeah. a lot of wealth. And also like real suffering. And I'm not... After I wrote this whole piece, I was looking or have other Indonesians thought about this word amok, and there have, I think I, I, I saw one scholarly article by an Indonesian who was also like, look at this Indonesian dictionary definition, this is right. so ridiculous. Okay. And uh, they described like uh, amok, amok, uh, that translation is like psychopathology as the European's way of um, translating the, I think they use the words depression and humiliation of the native. Huh. under slavery and colonialism. So, yeah, again, misrepresenting, though, obviously. Yeah, and, and those emotions, right? Depression becomes, like, DSM category, yeah. came out of nowhere, the problem is with you, rather yeah. than, oh, my God, I enslaved your whole entire... F I'm so sorry. And there's something <laughs> there's in really that... really none of that. Yeah, there's something in that as well about... The, 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 well, obviously, bodies are, are central, and what is done to them, what bodies do to bodies, and the suffering and the rage, but in the discourse of, oh, humanity's problem, humanity needs to solve this problem. It's ignoring all those other bodies that were drowned and burned. And, and, and continue to be. And continue like indigenous to be. Peoples, indigenous women in particular mm. are being killed and murdered and threatened with violence this very minute. Like what I said about the Indonesian government worker was point, that is all true. Yeah, yeah. I've had family, like I've, I know, I intimately feel in my body, mind, mm. and disability justice cultures. We don't make a distinction between mind and body, which is, again, Cartesian duality mm. and all mm. of that. This is so core to who, how I function as a human being. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad another thing I got to say is that for the, you know, I've, I've been creating for my whole life, but under a Western gaze, I see that rage being commodified, frankly, yeah. you know? Yeah. And like, I get gigs like this, but I really wanted this gig to be like, what is that, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, what are yeah. you doing with my heart? Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing with our hearts? And the sense that some, some bodies are, are safer or more sheltered from the climate crisis, and some bodies are allowed to rage in a certain way, and in some bodies way. are, yeah. Are not, and yeah, and I think we were having a conversation yeah. um, backstage about how, Actually, all bodies feel the climate crisis. Yes. But sometimes we feel it as comfort. Some We've, bodies feel it as comfort. Yeah. Saying, but yeah. even, like, I feel the climate crisis as comfort when I use a moisturizer that contains palm oil. Right. Yeah. And it makes my skin feel soft. Palm oil is in half of the groceries that, in Western groceries, 50%. Uh, it's in our ramen, in our shampoos, conditioners. Um, please try and find non-palm oil using brands because, um, and I lit today, I like, I forgot to use my non-palm oil moisturizer and my partner was like, you can borrow my moisturizer. Um, we have a non-palm oil also because he knows how it affects me, but like, yeah. um, but there was like a little bit left of this palm oil moisturizer and I, I used it this morning. Yeah. And I'm glad I'm not ashy, you know, <laughs> like it's, that is climate crisis felt yeah. as comfort. Yeah. And what we need to do is to do away with, because capitalism like divorces the many stages that it takes yeah. for a rainforest to be destroyed because a bunch of indigenous peoples were kidnapped, murdered, beaten, raped, assaulted, threatened, um, uh, ripped off 
until they sold the rainforest mm. to a palm oil plantation. Even sustainable palm oil, sometimes it's a palm oil plantation that has been bought on land that was pre... So it's a palm oil plantation that was... They have to cut all the rainforest to make this palm oil plantation, right? That's why plant trees is ridiculous because palm oil trees Which create, trees and where? Yeah, which yeah. trees and where. And then sometimes that plantation is sold to another plantation. And because that new plantation did not do the rainforest burning, they can say that in their reports, right? We didn't do any rainforest burning. So basically there is no sustainable palm oil. I don't ever. think so. I have friends who disagree and they work hard right. to make palm oil quote unquote sustainable, but I think it, I know, I yeah. just know too, I know too much. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I yeah, know yeah. too much. Um, and I don't think there is at all. Yeah. And, um, uh, and the many steps that takes. Uh, and then, you know, you have um, disenfranchisement of people at the palm oil plantation, the workers, yeah. laborers. And then until that becomes, you know, part of global mega corporations, moisturizers and makeup and, and cosmetics and serums, serums and everything else. And it's like... There's a sense of obfuscation. Like you say, almost like the, 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 the systemic obfuscation, it's, almost um, like the smoke of the forest. It is the molecularization yeah. and the diffusing of amyl. Yeah. But also, as you were saying, of all the steps of the process that it takes yeah. to bring the destruction that then exactly. makes people feel exactly. rage. And, and you don't think, oh my god, this serum is going to reduce my hyperpigmentation, and it was connected to a sexual assault 25 steps ago, because you don't hear about that. No, you don't. Because literally, we're not re reported on properly, yeah. and it's not... Um, that, that, yeah, that there's a sense of reach. the rage that you... so powerfully and beautifully explore and explode as well. I think I felt like you did lots of exploding in a really good way of rage as something that almost shines a light, isn't the right expression, but goes against the obfuscation. So rage is a, is a suddenness and it's uh, deep coming from lots of other things I suddenness. Hope so. That's what I hope I'd so. love to hear you talk more about rage. And you, you wrote, you, you said, um, rage in, in the context of the civilizing mission. Yeah. Um, and how that... Oh, it's really useful. It's right. really useful in the context of the civilizing mission if you can commodify rage. You can commodify Completely. rage. 100%. But the, the sort of Diversity and inclusion, baby, you know? It's, it's but rageful in a good yeah. way. <laughs> Please be rageful in a good way. But the, 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 the counter to that almost is, I'm not seeking solutions, but you said, you know, you, you spoke about rage in communion where none, rage, none can rage alone. Sorry? You, you spoke about um, rage in, in communion. Yes. Yeah, I'd love to yeah. hear more about no, that. No, 100%. Yeah. This, is all, this is why solidarity is really important. Right. Um, rather than sympathy, empathy. Yeah. And I'm certainly not alone in this. There are millions and millions. We are the majority world, actually. And that feels like the strength, you know, the, as, as opposed to the obfuscation and the commodification of rage. Yeah. Tell me more about this. Yeah, I mean, that's why protests are more. important as a form of, you know, <laughs> releasing rage, right, uh -huh, yeah. in a social context. Um, but even at protests, like uh, the climate protests that were here in Edinburgh, I know um, I did a panel with somebody who, an in, another indigenous um, climate justice activist who said we were supposed to be friend of the line and we weren't, you know, we, mm. there were so many of us and this wasn't covered. And this COP26. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that has, it's, Sadly, always the way, but also uh, in the face of despair, I like to remember what um, the amazing writer Leanne Betasamo Sake Simpson has taught me from her works, which is uh, our existence is proof that colonialism did not survive. Yeah. Colonialism has failed, actually, and it did not survive everywhere, so to speak. That the project of colonialism has failed because Could we not are take still, over everything because we still have resistance and we still have rage and we have always done this. Le Leanne's book is called "As We Have Always Done." Okay. Um, this is tale as old as <laughs> circular time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and that is what we can hold on to to yeah. um, not collapse into despair. And I, I was so interested in the the turning from the. Tran mistranslating of, of Amo and the rage against that to a place and time where that does not matter because it does not exist because there's, you said um, Amok, Amok? 
yeah. is felt cradled, nurtured as a seething that encourages delight. A seething that encourages delight. That's um, just wonderful. Can, I had the image of yeast <laughs> and, and how that brings life and growth and ultimately nourishment and food. Are you saying amok is a yeast infection? I'm not. Okay. <laughs> I'm saying it's okay, something I'm that checking. brings bread or <laughs> nourishment. Or, but I'd love to hear more about this yeah, seething that again, encourages oh, delight. Once again, I write things. So I'm not sure <laughs> no, why I say this. But, um, <laughs> no, but a seething that encourages delight, I think it's because it, there is a pleasurable aspect to release, right, and yeah. catharsis. Yeah. And I honestly... Um, I did not, it, when we did the rehearsal earlier, I did not cry, I did not yell as much, <laughs> I don't think. Um, and it just came out of me. Yeah. And it actually feels really good mm. to have done that. Um, so thank you for my free therapy. Uh, <laughs> actually paid the room. Um, but um, I, it, it does feel good to yeah, let yeah. it all out. Um, and I think that's what rage does. It's When we feel angry, it's because something doesn't feel right in our bodies, right? Mm. And we're like, I need to get this out it has to come out somewhere whether at the gym or you know like you have it has to be something has to be released yeah yeah so anger is telling you to release something and that release is pleasurable I think. yeah and, and the idea of amok as something that then brings that and is, amok is, is teacher and, and amok, amok is, teacher. is guide and yeah. amok is and i want i really want to reclaim because i'm so scared of what little babies are gonna learn about the word mm. Yeah. Now that our dictionary only has violent definitions for yeah. it, and it just means rage. Yeah, which is something that we are given, or yeah. we have. And notice or... how we are basically aping colonial dictionaries yeah. Yeah. that reflect ourselves in yeah. this distorted, um, dehumanizing way. Uh, yeah. And it, it links back to a quote that you, you gave me, and we were talking about backstage, and that seems to be used a lot in your book, ultimatum orangutan, or ultimatum orangutan. Um, the, the explanation of what we call the Anthropocene yeah. um, from indigenous scholar, I'm gonna read it abridged, from indigenous scholar Zoe S. Todd and Heather Davis, that the Anthropocene is not a new event, but the continuation of practices of dispossession and genocide, coupled with a literal transformation of the environment that has been at work for the last 500 years. And the idea of this vast and horrifying process. It, you know, if you think of it, your brain just kind of seizes Yeah, genocides on genocides, and it's continuing. But the idea of taking yeah. one word, one word, a set of not many vowels and consonants, and taking that, reclaiming that one word as a resistance, which widens out like a pool, is, hope, is yeah, so, really interesting. Um, that quote, I use it a lot when teaching, and also it helps... Um, so that is a quote from, as mentioned, indigenous scholars. And the, and the last Todd bit of it, which I didn't, oh, I didn't read. Sorry, yeah. if you want to read it yeah, as well. Yeah, of course. Further, the Anthropocene continues a logic of the universal, which is structured to sever the relations between mind, body, and land. There's no it's such thing severing. as the universal. That yeah. is a colonial invention, enlightenment invention. There's no such thing as the universal. Colonialism has always worked to sever the relationships between mind, body, and land. And that quote, and they themselves say, we didn't come up with this quote. We, yeah, okay. we, this is the belief of hundreds and hundreds of indigenous civilizations yeah. around the world, right? The invention of quote unquote nature is also tied in with, oh, mind, your mind is separate from your body and your body is separate from the forest. Mm -hmm. And we never originally got felt that. Felt that. And yeah. so the Anthropocene needs to be counted from 500 years ago. It's not right. 100 years ago. And that is what really gets my amok going, yes. is this ahistorical, complete dismissal of like, and time and again, you know, the and like nature writing panel I was on that I yeah. mentioned, yeah. That, is not a, that is not an isolated incident. No. And it feels like an uphill struggle to even get people to understand that sometimes the way you use the word nature and even your quote unquote environmentalism is really racist, genocidal, and anti-environment. <laughs> and obfuscates and, and does not obfuscates. recognize. Yeah. yeah, completely. And that is what is used to push out indigenous peoples. Yeah. If you say, oh, indigenous peoples, they're not stewards of their biomes. They are humans and humans are the problem. So we mm. need to kick out people I mean, that same nature writer, I'm sorry, said, we need everyone to move to the cities. She actually said that. And I was oh. like, 
I have no words, ma'am. No, <laughs> I have no really? words. Goodness. I have no words. That, if you use nature in that way, it's been used, and it, you know, this is, if you look at deep regional knowledge, mm. there are quote unquote nature parks that were created by colonial forces by kicking out indigenous peoples. Yeah. And reservations used as reservations, as well, yeah. nature safaris, right? To use yeah. for your pleasure, but also you, say, you can say you're managing the environment and indigenous peoples are no longer you allowed to even be there. And, and central to that is this word sever, sever the relationship. Yeah, and severing that relationship. Yeah, and, and this, this, it feels that this evening your art and words and work have, have gone against that severing somehow. They have helped me certainly to think in new and different ways about not only reconnecting, but reconsidering the way words can express time and body. And I'm going back to another quote that is what Ilya Kaminsky said about your work. I love this. He said, this is planetary poetics. That also really stopped me that expression. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Planetary poetics as a, as a way to counteract the severing yeah, that was so so kind of Ilya to write um, a blurb for the book. Yeah. But I hope that my planetary poetics shows that there's no such thing as the universal and no such thing as a single planetary consensus and mm. no such thing as a single planetary culture and that if we are to save this planet, we need to cherish and preserve multiplicity. Mm. And we need to cherish and preserve indigenous cultures that are so different one from another, but are so in tune with their biomes. You don't mm -hmm. need the amount of, the amount of times in Indonesia, I used to work in development <laughs> and internalism. Um, and I would just come across like such um, paternalistic ways of like natural resource management that is like, we can apply the same thing we did in Zimbabwe yeah. to this yeah. village in Indonesia. It's like, you don't know the language, you don't know the biome, you don't know the yeah. universe. Yeah. You don't know the concept. There's, um, I had a, an uncle who sadly passed away during the pandemic, um, mm. but he uh, was a local government official in our village, um, uh, my mother's home village and uh, in that area. And he, I remember talking to him and he was like, these like Western development NGOs, they come in and they're like, we're going to give you clean water. We have indigenous waterway yeah. systems. Yeah. The water it, it is was clean. clean before. It was clean. Yeah. Yeah. And instead you want to install, and you want to put a factory here that mm. is you know, going to poison our kids forever. And you want to put like mining tailings here is, you know, the other part of that story is like, it's so weird to me that Colonialism, by the way, is not past. Mm. It is the present and it is the near future. Mm. Um, and it is the cause of all of this. And it really is so strange to me how people can be like, natural resource management, but it is totally, please let us continue to take these hectares, multiple Denmarks wide of, you know, yeah. of a multiple, you know, like um, United Kingdom wide tracts of land for our lotions and ramen and yeah, serums, yeah, yeah. please. That, that has to stay. We need to keep taking. But here's a way to clean that but stream. But here's a way to clean that one little yeah. stream uh, in a way that you don't, that we don't think you understand this, yeah. by the way. We don't think you understand this and that is actually going to mess up a lot of indigenous systems. I see it in Bali with my activist friends in Bali where water, uh, like, the fight for water in Bali is real. The fight for the bay, uh, Banoa Bay, which is um, also going to be turned into like basically a strip mall. Uh, resorts mm. are eating up so much paddy field land. And speaking of art, a few years ago, there was like a movement in Bali um, of artists putting gigantic, basically, you know, like the Hollywood sign? They would put okay. that on the, uh, the equivalent on the ground on paddy fields so that when you drive by, you just see not for sale. Huh. Across so many paddy fields, like white signs, not for sale, not for sale, not for sale. Um, because so much of Bali is just be, has, has been bought up mm. and is continuing to be bought up. Mm. And if we're going to fight climate change, we need indigenous stewards who, by the way, have temples for these rivers, have like yeah. goddesses and gods for these, who will literally worship these rivers and, and will do anything for them. Uh, even the word steward implies a relationship of, of protection, but not of control. 
Exactly. And I really like that. And equanimity yeah. between us and, and non severance. Nature. I don't even so. know how to say, yeah. no, like this world. Yeah. This world. Yeah. Our um, world. Yeah. Yeah. Thank so. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We're not done. Oh, We're okay. going to open up to questions from the oh, audience. Oh, yeah. I'm just trying right, to stop sorry. myself from you know, um, monopolizing the questions. We have some written in from online. Thank you. Um, I see them. Um, I wonder if anyone has a question from here in the audience. Okay, I will read one from online. I'm just slightly scanning to check that there are questions and not comments, because that would be my invitation, is to think of questions but not comments. And if you do have a question, there's a microphone, but if you could wait for it to arrive to you before speaking, so then it can be picked up for the online people as well. So, we have someone saying, thank you. It is powerful to express rage so beautifully. How does the validity of rage, in your opinion, get measured and ranked? And are universities complicit in that prioritizing? Which is a really interesting question. I suppose you could, yeah, universities being institutions. Um, 1,000%. 1,000%? 1, 1,000%. <laughs> person online. Okay, okay. that's it. That's it. <laughs> right. no. What are your thoughts about this? No, again, with that management thing, right? Mm. Like, you can, I, you know what? Universities are colonial institutions here. And if you really want to, you can't say, like, so I used to work at Decolonizing Arts Institute, University of the Arts London. Mm -hmm. And people came to us with like different definitions of decolonizing, right? And some people were like, I've decolonized my syllabus. It now has white feminist writers in it. And I'd be like, OK. Um, like, decolonizing is not a buzzword. It is. Um, it was armed. It was an is armed and and physical violent struggle. Mm. Decolonizing is the literal dismantling of colonial states. The U.S., Canada, New Zealand, Australia, are all illegal states. They are illegally occupied. So Hawaii yeah. is illegally occupied. And there's the land back movement. Hashtag land back movement in. Um, that North American colleagues have. And yeah. that is real, it's valid. I know a lot of people dismiss them, but it is so valid. There needs to be return of land to indigenous peoples. And I feel like if universities really want to engage with decolonizing, they need to look at how they are colonial institutions benefiting from mm. capital accumulation and benefiting from complying with colonial states, which we all do, I certainly do it. I speak in English, I work in English. Yeah. I have a visa to the United Kingdom, yeah. you know. Um, but the idea of needing to look at it again and again and again and not stopping after one syllabus. No, it's not. Constant it's not, work. Um, so famously, Tuck and Yang, the mm. scholars, Eve Tuck and uh, Kay Wayne Yang, I believe, have this incredible article. You should look it up if you haven't seen it. It's called Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. Mm. They work in universities, and they were like, in the North American context, if you say decolonize, you have to mean decolonize, meaning you give land back to indigenous peoples. Mm. Anything short of that is not decolonization. Mm. It is what they call rescuing settler colonial innocence. It's mm. rescuing settler innocence. If you're a settler colonial state, and you're a citizen of that state, and you say, I want to decolonize, but I still want to live here and enjoy my beach house that is not my land, you mm. know? Mm. Like, that's not decolonizing. Yeah. Um, and the adoption, they say, of decolonizing discourse in universities, that perpetuates the settler innocence. You're not talking about actually giving land back. And the amount of times when I was working at the university, and I continue to do that, because a lot of people are like, oh, you're doing decolonizing work. And I'm like, am I? I just talk shit on a microphone, mm. you know? Like, is this actually, I'm not like giving land deeds back to yeah. people who really you need them. have to them. do their doing. And think about what it would take if a, land, a piece of land, giant piece of land, has been obtained again through sexual assault, kidnapping, beatings, et cetera, it's now palm oil plantation owned by, insert the name of your megacorp here. Mm. How many steps would it take to actually return that land to indigenous peoples? Yeah, yeah. Will it ever happen? It must happen. And people are actively working towards that every day. People are giving their lives. Yeah. People are really suffering to make this reality happen. That's their ammo. Yeah. That is AMO, and yep. that's actual decolonizing is AMO. Yeah, that's brilliant. Any questions from here? 
Yes, um, one at the back and then one at the front and then some more from the online people. Thank you. Hi, Oka. Uh, I'm Florentina. Uh, Hi. Previously, so you at TEDx Jakarta stage like 10 years ago. Oh my God, are you Indonesian? Yeah, I'm Indonesian. Hello. <laughs> oh my God. So um, I have a question uh, re related to your answer like uh, just now. So uh, I read a book about decolonizing wealth by uh, Edward Villanueva about how philanthropy could decolonize and get back, uh, give back to, to the indigenous people, uh, basically with many stories uh, US centric. Uh, do you think that in Indonesia, it's gonna be a phase when we have this decolonization of wealth um, to give back to the indigenous people? Because uh, indigenous people are, are usually like being marginalized community and they're gonna be affected uh, so much by the climate, right? Um, I, I would like to know your perspective, thank you. Thank you so much. By the way, um, thank you for coming to my TEDx Jakarta talk like a million years ago. Um, uh, I am wary of that phrase becoming a catchphrase that is part of the problem, right? Like mm. you slap this label on something decolonizing wealth, unless you're, again, unless you're allowing people to, um, unless you're freeing people's neighbors who are non-human from being kept hostage, and eliminated, like what is that? Because what's happening right now in Indonesia is government, there are government workers who are incredible, like the one who I think you know was poisoned to death for, um, uh, we can guess who did that, um, for challenging a mine being built. Mm. But there are also so many government workers who, and I see this on social media, just videos of like people confront, indigenous peoples confront the government workers because they've been swindled, right? Mm. And government workers will say, yeah, we'll give you, you can be stewards of this place. But actually, no. Legally, that's not what's going to happen. And we have actually stolen land from you. That is what's happening right now. And that needs to stop first and foremost before you can, you know, and uh, before you can have that conversation. So I'm very wary also about like thought leader culture, you know, sort of being like, decolonize well, do this, do that. And it's like, what are you actually achieving? We are there's so many thieves among us, and we are thieves ourselves, right? We are part of every, nobody, every, everybody's complicit in colonialism, right? If you live in the United Kingdom and you live in Edinburgh, like it's, mm. how, how do we um, step away from the violence and actually try and contribute towards something yeah. that's more There's a question. Thank you. For your question. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm coming to you for sure, but there's, this really connects to a question. What you just said, how can we living here do that? A question from Liz online. Thank you, Liz. She says, thank you again, a powerful, challenging performance. Um, in universities, we hear the spoken and written word mostly, and this dominates. What are the many different ways we can hear words and how can the way we hear change the future because it feels it connects to what you just said oh, I like, love that yeah, yeah. Like so living here what how can we what can we so um, as a disabled person I love the concept of multi-sensorial translation mm -hmm. I think access is translation mm -hmm. uh, the fact that this event is live captioned that's access and that is also translation yeah. for um, non-seeing people and seeing and hearing people, we need to understand that we have also been colonizers of disabled languages, deaf and disabled languages, 100%. Um, and we need to understand that all sensorial ways of understanding language are valid. Mm -hmm. um, and that is also part of returning, uh, what Tuck and Yang says, the colonization is the return of indigenous land and life. Mm -hmm. And the and life part and, and the land part also relates so much that to implies understanding and yeah, so yeah. things. Yeah. Hmm. Great. So much to think about. Um, there was a question from you in the front. Thank you. Hi. Is this working yet? Um, the processes of colonialization and ecological overexploitation well predate capitalism. You know, colonialism was happening um, thousands of years ago. We don't know when it began, the conquest and stealing of land from other people. And these islands were largely deforested by the time of the Romans. Some of the worst environmental damage in the world was done under the Soviet Union, a non-capitalist, supposedly non-capitalist system. So I'm just 
wondering why such close identification with capitalism, admittedly it's accelerated it, but it, it's not intrinsic to capitalism, it predated. I think the fact that the majority of the world has been victim to colonial capitalism is a very real fact. Mm -hmm. And it is true, humans have not, you know, human, the, human history is so vast, right? And as you said, you know, deforestation happens under different circumstances, right? But what is happening right now, what is driving climate change is the theft of indigenous lands over hundreds of years and the past 500 years in particular, in particular, because the systems that we have now are the, the systems that the majority of the world is under now, including in Russia, right, including certainly in the United Kingdom, stems from colonial capitalism, one concept, that again, as mentioned, the first proto-megacore Dutch East Indies company, right, the form of capitalism that we have now, this hyper-capitalism, began as this like very destructive experiment involving slavery, torture, et cetera, mm. right? So you can talk about exceptions, that is true, but you have to be realistic about where we are right now and the fact that these systems are capitalism, mm. right? This is not, we are not under a Soviet, we're not under a communist mm. state, most of us, you know? So where do we go from here? Yeah. yeah. And communist states may well also, you know, destroy forests and in other parts of the world, but the majority of, that's why I say I'm of the majority world. I don't necessarily say I'm a woman of color. Mm. I say I'm a woman of the majority world mm. because that's who we are. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's these what's are happening. just the facts. So, yeah. yeah. That connects to another question from online, which again says, thank you, really powerful and moving, and says, it's awesome to bring a poet's power to this urgent topic. There was also some playfulness to the language and sounds. And it, the question is, do you find play and humour has a role in your writing and how does it work with, work with or against rage and urgency, which feels that it connects to what you just said about, this is where we are here and now, this is what's been happening, this is the rage. Oh. And, and this question seems to bring in poetry and the power of that, but also playfulness and language and sounds and humour. I'd love to hear more about that. Oh, thank a you lovely so, question, so... online anonymous person. Yeah, thank you, anonymous. Um, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> a huge, huge thank you to, to, to that person. Yeah. Uh, it goes back to what you're asking about. Seething delight. Seething, <laughs> seething so great. Delight. Seething, right. seething um, delight. You're looking at a failed improv comedian. Uh, okay. I was supposed Did to not be, know that. <laughs> I was supposed to be part of my university's improv comedy team, but I didn't, I didn't continue. I, I wanted to study. I was such a, I was a very horrible decision. So anyway, so I think that frustrated, like improv comedian is always, and I don't know where I'd be without humor because mm. other, you know, like you can't be in this dark pit all the time. It no. needs to come out. And I think that rage and just like um, comedy and tragedy, it's always kind of two sides Laughter, of the same tears. coin. Yeah. Laughter, tears. Yeah. Um, I think that, uh, I think that it comes from that same place mm. where it, your emotions are simmering, you don't know which direction it's going to come seething. out. Seething. Yeah, seething. Yeah. And the seething can produce humor and hopefully delight. Um, but I, I think that hopefully in this performance, humor is part of Amok and Amok is part of humor as well. And Amok is humorous. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of its many shape-shifting forms. So thank, thank you so you. much for that. Yeah, thank you. I am wondering if we have a question from the audience. Yes, thank you. Hi. Um, I was just going to ask if you obviously use nature in a lot of your poetry in this poem that you performed, and is there a, a place that you uh, particularly like to be and find inspiring for your art hmm. in the world? Um, yeah, it's actually on the cover of my book, is um, my mom's home area. Uh, the cover of Ultimatum Orangutan is like my hand with a hadouken against like a bulldozer, but then the background and it's purple. Anyway, so uh, I put the place on, on the book because I uh, love it so much. So thanks for that question. Yeah, it's, good. it's very, um, uh, Minangkabau people, we're actually the world's largest matrilineal culture. Hmm. Um, and the bloodline is passed down through the mother like other yeah. matrilineal cultures. Um, and we own the land. 
uh, we give the men fancy names like Duke of Emeralds, which is literally my uncle's title, but like, what does that mean? We have- What, what does it mean? I don't know. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> Who knows? My granddad's name, his um, village name was King of the Voice actually, which I think is a backhanded compliment because we're all so loud. Okay. <laughs> like, so I, this is genetic, but like, I guess it's like, oh, King of the Voice, okay. <laughs> Maybe there's something there. But we own like, the land. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but okay. we own the land, yeah. Right. Um, oh, thank you. Another thing I did not know. Um, oh, my goodness. Uh, if you're happy to keep staying here and asking questions, I'm up for it. But um, the person who rose, yes, you were quicker. And then the lady and then behind, I think. Hi. Um, Hello. Yeah, go um, One of the things that I found really powerful about the performance was about um, the fact that it was based around one word and then thinking about how many other words that probably have the same contortion to them and I was wondering about the the scale of that and whether you think that this is the best example of that or whether you'd be interested in applying that same concept and looking at um, other words. Mm. Oh, what a wonderful question and let me be the first to say I don't know all the words <laughs> so I cannot possibly say <laughs> I don't know. I grew up bilingual in English and Indonesian. I don't know all the words in either, and I'm a trans. I, I edit a translation magazine. <laughs> like I don't, I don't know all the words. I'm constantly yeah. discovering new words. That's the great thing about editing. Maybe a that's something magazine. each of us could do after this. <laughs> I'm gonna go and think of the languages I know and think what has been traduced and mistranslated. That might be a great thing for us all yeah. to do. Yeah. Or certainly yourself. Um, Thank you. The person with the teal shirt had a question. I think. Thank you for the performance lecture and for explaining that it was a performance lecture because I don't think I've ever heard one before. So that was great. Um, um, yeah, so I was uh, at an EFI event as recently as yesterday and um, on the topic of climate justice. And one of the speakers said that climate justice is not going to happen at COP. Um, mm. COP27, mm. or speaking of has been, is, will be, whichever COP. Mm. Um, but, in, you know, not that COP isn't important, like I don't want to, I can't say the nuance that she said, but, um, but climate justice happens, you know, somewhere else. So how should we be thinking about the next COP, do you think? You made me think of place and where cops take place, mm. the literal places where they are. And I think that um, climate justice may not happen at the conferences, but they can happen in the cities and towns where the conferences take place in collectives that believe in the same thing. <laughs> so I think that is a kind of a distinction. I think it, it needs to happen everywhere <laughs> and it has starts the concept of the individual is also such a Western thing mm. as related to the communal. And I think it begins with every person, but it begins also with every person realizing that they're not never individual mm. and we all form a whole, um, whether planetary or your country or your town or your family, you know, we are all part of communal formations where climate, where actions towards climate justice can happen. So that happens everywhere, hopefully. Yeah, thank you. I think so I could add one very quick comment. I know they're not allowed, but I have discovered at the I, supermarket. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm really sorry, but we're already running out of time. Okay, there was Patterson's Oat Cakes behind. doesn't have palm oil. Who, who doesn't have palm oil, sorry? Patterson's. Patterson, okay, I'm gonna say that for everyone. Patterson's Oat Cakes don't have palm oil. That's not a, that's a really thank useful, you. that's, that's so really useful. useful. Information, thank thank very you. not a comment at Keep all. There. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, one question from you, and then one from online, and then we will have to stop. I'm sorry. Go. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for that performance. It was really moving, and I was definitely struck by the raw emotion that it involved. Mm. Um, I've been reading a very interesting book recently on degrowth, um, Georges Callis, which I think he's a Greek author. Um, and I just wondered, as you've been mentioning a lot on capitalism and its 
problematic history and I'm sure future. Um, I don't think problematic, problematic is an understatement. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just wondered if you see a future outside of capitalism, does degrowth fit into that for you? Um, what would you see the future of climate justice looking like in Edinburgh and on, on, on the ground? And I guess just can you put into any practicalities for the people here today who I'm sure have also made sort of lifestyle choices, um, yeah. feeding into climate mm -hmm. justice. I just wonder if you have any suggestions of how we can move forward with hope. Thank you. Oh, wonderful question. Thank you. Um, I actually haven't read that book, but I feel like I would agree with a lot of its um, points. Again, caveat that I haven't read it. Um, I do see a future outside of capitalism. I think uh, the late wonderful Ursula Le Guin yes. said, thank you. In, yeah, that wonderful quote. Um, something like, I really don't want to misquote or something, but I think it was something like, uh, capitalism. We live under capitalism. We live under capitalism. What is the quote? We live under capitalism. I believe it is. We live under capitalism. It seems inevitable. It seems as inevitable as the rule of kings once yeah, did. So, so was the, so was so the was divine the right of kings. Right, capitalism seems inevitable. So once did the divine right of kings, or something like that. You yeah. can look that up. Yeah. But that really struck me, and it's like a hundred percent, a hundred percent. We can create. There have been, if if colonialism has failed because indigenous communities and stewards stewarding of biomes still exist, um, I totally see a future outside of capitalism. Although you know. We all live in it, and I bought a dress yesterday you know, online. You know, <laughs> we do. We, yeah. It's really hard not to participate in it. To live, we have to participate in it. But yeah. there are ways to to yeah to not feed this this machine mm. that decontextualizes and decontextualizes Suffers. and decontextualizes. Um, try and find local purveyors of what you need. Yeah. Get to know your neighbors, <laughs> support local businesses, but also look at the ingredients of oatcakes and Patterson's and see, yeah, and yeah. how they relate to other communities around the world. Um, yeah, re it's reconnect against the severing. Exactly. In a way. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I'm, I'm, well, thank you. And, and you. I'm going to read out the last question from another anonymous online because it feels like the perfect last question in what I hope will be an ongoing thought process and conversation process after this event. Um, it's about the role of higher education, which feels fitting um, mm -hmm. where we are. Mm -hmm. The role of higher education in creating spaces for emotional, often painful and furious, production response and reaction. Mm -hmm. Is this something that can be part of education and learning? How do we make room for it? I think as a teacher, 100 percent yeah. you can teach in the classroom and you can ask you can provoke students and also teachers because teaching is always a two-way street right I learn as much from my students as yeah as yeah. they hopefully learn from me um, you can create situations and connections that are very precious and very special that expose people to ideas that could mm. not be um, the, they would not find elsewhere, but also, as mentioned, higher education has a colonialism problem, yes. and there are forms of their indigenous education um, forms that do not fit with Western forms of education. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who has gone through the, like very colonial education systems, I have a PhD. Mm -hmm. Like, the, <laughs> I remember once when I was doing my dissertation. Uh, somebody came back to me, uh, a professor came back to me with like, I, you really need an academic citation for this fact you wrote about your own culture. Yeah. And I was like, I learned this from my grandma. I'm pretty sure she's yeah. right. Yeah, like, she was called. <laughs> she, yeah. would, she has no access to LexisNexis yeah. or, you know, um, yeah. JSTOR, unfortunately. Yeah. Also, she's dead, but, you know. But, you know. <laughs> so it'd be something about <laughs> widening and connecting again. Yeah, so. and it's this form of like nothing is legitimate, uh, nothing is a legitimate form of knowledge or knowledge production unless it's through the Western educational system and through this and through academia. Yeah. And it's like academia needs to recognize there are multiple forms, so many multiple forms of knowledge production and education. That's what life is, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and to be open to yeah. that. That's a great answer. 
Thank you. Um, I'm going to now, before everyone um, applauds and goes away, say that um, the Edinburgh Futures Institute has got several MSc programmes um, that look at development on themes linked to climate justice. So also planetary health, sustainable land and cities, circular economy, AI and data ethics, which feels also connected to the Very much widening so. up of options of what we can learn and study and ask each other about. Um, and also that if you want to learn and hear more from Oka, which I certainly do, there will be another Edinburgh Futures Conversation event, which takes place online on the 19th of October. So I have that now firmly in my mind. But I've, I've learned so much from your work and art and, and emotions um, and knowledge generally. So thank you so much oh. for everything this evening. Thank and you I so feel much. that the audience as well has, there's been a lot of nodding and warmth and feeling and emotion. So please join me in thanking Oka at the end of this wonderful evening together. Thank you.